I'm Christine, and this is my husband, Ty. We're building a four-person airplane in our garage. We've never done this before, so we are learning as we go. And while we've occasionally found ourselves in some interesting situations, it has been a whole lot of fun to do together. Come join us as I share our experiences, tips and tricks we learn along the way, and other fun aviation adventures. So we're about to get kicked off with the elevators, but before we do, there's a couple of things I wanted to go over with y'all. First, as you just saw, I made a new intro for the Plain Lady videos, and I would love to get some feedback, so let me know what you think in the comments down below. The other thing is I have created a Patreon account for Plain Lady. I will leave the link in the description down below. Currently, there is just a $3 monthly tier that you can sign up for if you want to help support my channel. It will give you access to a private patron-only Discord as well as a sticker pack, but in the Discord, you'll be able to chat with myself and Tyler and provide input and feedback on anything related to Plain Lady. If you're interested in seeing any additional tiers, let me know and give me an idea of what kind of rewards you'd like to see for any additional tiers added in the future. So thanks so much to any of you who decide to go over there and sign up to be patrons. As always, you can also support the channel by going to plainlady.com store and purchasing Why Buy Planes When You Can Build Them apparel. Or if you are purchasing an empennage kit for any model, vans, RV, you can go to plainlady.com slash referral, download and complete that form and send it in when you receive your empennage kit. Vans will send me $100 as a thank you, but it doesn't cost you anything extra, but it does mean a lot to know that I've helped somebody else out there who's looking to build their own plane. Let's get back to the build. We are starting off here on day 66. The garage is empty, the tail cone is out, and we are starting with the elevators. Kicking things off right here in the beginning, uh, you've got to separate all of those elevator ribs into the different parts. And the key thing is to make sure to pair them off and number them so that you keep track of the different pairs as you keep building. Um, <laughs> totally random, but I saw this right away when we cut them. Do you not see this little face here? <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm just weird, but I thought it was so funny. It looked like all these little faces staring at me. What do you see later on when the rivets are in place? It looks even funnier. All right, but so for the ribs, to try and separate out these elevator ribs, I was able to use the snips. It was pretty easy to just go in there and get those trimmed. Uh, a little further ahead, you're separating out the shear clips, the E1022. Those were a little too thick to try and get with the snips, but that's what the band saw for, right? But basically it was just a lot of cutting and uh, trimming and deburring here at the beginning. All the fun things. <laughs> This is definitely somewhere where that deburring tip would come in handy. Uh, again, I'll put the link above and below, um, but making that little deburring tip for the Dremel out of the Scotch Bright wheel would have been super awesome to know about in this part with all the little like nooks and crannies and everything on all of those uh, elevator ribs. Okay, here on 9-2 steps four and five, you're doing two things. In step four, um, it's talking about putting, making sure there's the flanges are bent at 90 degrees. So what it's talking about is that the flanges are at a right angle to like the web of the pieces. Here in step five though, it says that you're supposed to uh, flute the E904 and E903 tip ribs and check for the straightness using the matching holes in the E913 counterbalance skin. This is the first part that I remember where like fluting was a really big deal because like basically the parts just would not fit right if they hadn't been fluted and fluted well. And um, you can see right about here where I think I'm starting to figure out that, you know, my holes aren't lining up like it's talking about. And fluting was still kind of a, uh, I didn't, I think, really understand how it was supposed to be working. And so Earlier, you might have seen in the video, like I was looking at everything and it talks in one of the instructions about, oh, test it and see if, like lay it flat on a table and see if it lays flat. And so that's what I'd been doing to try and check everything. But I, I think that there's a, a, at least for me personally, hearing it and seeing it a different way, uh, it finally made more sense, I think, of understanding like what 
it was that the fluting was supposed to accomplish. So I made a little uh, video snippet here to help try and explain it for anyone else out there who's maybe a bit more visual like I am. Seeing it uh, really made a difference to, to help me understand like, oh, okay, that's what it means when it says that in there. All right, so me personally, I'm a visual person, so I'm gonna try to show you how you use the fluting pliers to flute a, a piece here for the plane. So this is a spare part that we happen to have. And so with fluting, when you have like this line here of um, holes on the flange of one of the parts, sometimes when it's getting punched, if you kind of can look here, see if I'm trying to like line up looking straight down this uh, flange, that you can actually see as it goes further down, the holes start to curve away off to the left. And so what the fluting is gonna do is that's going to end up pulling this back into alignment. So now you actually have it where it's full, actually like straight all the way across. And how that works is so where we have the bend, I'm trying to think how to describe this. The bend is like towards the web side, not this open side. What you can do is you take the fluting pliers here and if you go and put a little you go like see here between the holes and you go and put like a little it's kind of hard i think because this one has the vinyl on it but you can start to see Ooh, sorry about that that was my neighbor's car alarm anyway but you can start to see here that there's like a little bit of a a uh, for lack of a better word, i guess a little dimple that's starting to form that's that's when you're fluting it and so what happens is when you're squeezing, let me do, I'm gonna do like a really extreme example to just kind of help show you. On this side, so if you go in, when you flute, if you flute, right there, so now you should be able to see it pretty good. You're, you're actually pinching and squeezing, and you see how it's made this little, like dimple there in the flange. And so what you've done, because you're squeezing this, it's literally like it's bending the part this direction because you're pulling on this flange. And so as you're like putting the pressure there and pulling on the flange, it's pulling the part this way. So if the curve is like this, this is how it's curving, obviously not that dramatic, but to get the idea of the direction, then when you put this flute in, it starts to do this and spread it out because you're yanking here on the flange and it starts to pull it back into that direction. So hopefully, I hope that makes sense, but see, the idea is that you go then down the line and I, I found it easier to, I would literally just start at one end and be like, okay, how does it look? Does it look like, uh, okay, we look pretty straight. Nope, okay, about here, it looks like maybe it's starting to curve. Come in, put a little uh, fluting in there and then, okay, Look at it again. And I just worked my way down. And the big thing is like, don't crank on these. Don't like, I mean, you don't need to necessarily put anything like this dramatic in here to, to fix it. Um, sometimes just the tiniest, more like this one even here where you can like barely notice. It looks almost just like it's a slight ding in the metal. Sometimes that's all you need is just a little bit to help pull it back into alignment. But I'll show you a picture then of, um, here's one of the wing ribs where it's before fluting and then after to show you how now it's pulled all of those holes there uh, into a straight line. And so that's, that's what the point is of the fluting. The, looking back now and reading the directions in section five for vans, it totally makes sense to me now reading it at the time, I think, again, I'm just very visual, so I couldn't, I couldn't like visualize what they were saying in my head. And, uh, but I hope, hopefully maybe go and read the section five and, and then look at this and see here the different examples. And hopefully if any of you are more visual like me, that should help kind of like marry the two together. So it makes sense what you're trying to do here with the fluting. So hopefully that helped out. Um, because I spent a lot of time trying to figure this out at this point uh, and figuring out, like, why isn't this working? Um, 
But I, f- I find the easiest way is definitely looking at the, the holes there and trying to line them up. Another way, and you can see here in the pictures, is with some of the parts that are curved, it's very easy to tell when it's sitting on a table, you'll see it won't sit flat. And then the idea is that when you get the, um, the holes all lined up, straight on the flange then it'll sit flat on the table i just personally like i tried kind of testing the table method and you know there might be some imperfections in the table i just had a it went a lot faster for me and it was a lot easier to check everything to just um to look down the flange there at the line of the holes and just keep going until i got those straight if you do end up accidentally over fluting the part, so now instead of straightening it, uh, you've actually now got it curving the opposite direction. What you can do is take the hand seamer and go in where you've you've fluted it a little bit too much and use the hand seamer to help flatten out uh, the the little fluting bit that you've done in there in between those particular two holes, and then that will help to correct that curve. But this, again, here in this step, this is a big deal because this was the first one where you can see here in the pictures, the holes just, they would not line up um, with all of the parts there if you didn't have it fluted right. And I think this was the first time that that was actually uh, an issue that we had. So just tr- you know, take your time. Um, try to get everything as straight as you can with the fluting before you try and click it together. And should have no issues. You just whack your face. Yeah! Like a complete dumb At least it's on camera. Uh, that's for the blooper reel. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't my finest moment, so gotta watch out for those counterbalance skins or they'll just jump right out and get you. Okay, so now we're on to 9-3, and we are bending the top and bottom skins there for the elevators. Follow the instructions just like they have there in the book. There's nothing that I think was anything silly or weird or awkward. It worked out perfectly with just bending it like it said to um, with the wood block and then taking the rivet gun and and using the flush rivet set to just hammer it out. And you can see here, I have a picture showing this is what it looks like before when you just do it with a block. And then here's how much of a difference it makes with that flush rivet set. But it turned out perfect and had zero issues. And then just used a hand seamer like it said to tweak it a little bit to get it to a perfect 90 degrees. So again, here's a picture you can see uh, after just using the rivet gun, and then here is after using the hand seamer to tweak it. All right, moving forward to 9-4 step two, where you are going to enlarge the holes for the trim cable routing hole in both of the E1002 front spars using the Unibit step drill. Um, I just wanted to make sure to really support this well while I was doing the drilling. So I used a bunch of different two by four. I put two pieces flanking either side of the hole there and clamped it down really good. And then just to not have it try and bow um, while I was clamping it down or drilling it, you can see there's another piece of two by four I just stuck somewhere in the middle just to help kind of prop it up and support it while I was doing the drilling. Easy peasy. So the spars and skins are now all starting to get clecoed together. And one thing to point out is on 9-5 step one, it does make sure to say note that except for the root ribs, the flanges of all the ribs are directed outboard on both elevators and the holes in the front spar used to attach the root ribs are 3 32nd inch while the holes for the other ribs are 1 8 inch. So, you know, don't enlarge them. Just keep that in mind. It's intentional. So just make sure to keep note of that. Everything else was pretty straightforward there on the rest of uh, 9-5, clecoing parts together, final drilling, uh, same goes there with most of 9-6. Where it got interesting is uh, step six on 9-6, where you are now attaching the um, tip rib assemblies that we made earlier with the E903, E904, and E913 to that front spar and the bottom skin. 
So, in it, like up to this point, normally think about like when you've had the different ribs that have gone on the horizontal stabilizer or whatnot, where there's a piece of the flange on one of those ribs where it's kind of going over the spar. Normally, there's it's been separated and it's uh, bent at a slightly different angle. It leaves a little bit of a gap, right? For the little spar to fit underneath each of those little individual holes on those little individual like flange tabs. But here it doesn't have that. And right here where I'm talking about, if you look here on this picture where I've circled it, this is, this is where you don't have that. And this is where it was a little intriguing because the question came of how are we supposed to layer these? You have the bottom skin, you have the E913, you have the E904, and then you have the front spar. And all four of these layers stack there. And so again, you have on the E904, there isn't one of those little like notched bits of flange like I showed you in the earlier picture that we were used to seeing. And so we weren't sure if that um, E904 was supposed to go under the spar, like on top, sitting sandwiched perfectly on top of the counterbalance skin, or if it was supposed to go on top of the spar flange. And so what we ended up finding after looking around online was on Ed and Colleen's blog, Good Plain Living. I'll put a link down below um, where Ed had posted a picture showing how they did it. And the way they did it that we ended up doing as well was to have the top or bottom skin. Uh, then you had the counterbalance skin, then the front spar flange, and then the flange from the E904. Here's a picture. We did try it to see what would it look like if we did it with that flange of the E904 under the spar since it didn't have the little notched bit. And you can see here, it just looks weird. It, it looks like everything's spreading and it didn't look right. So when you now switch it up, like I mentioned earlier, you can see here in this photo, everything just marries together like really nicely and it looked a lot better. So we're like, all right, we're just gonna go with that. You'll have the same uh, situation when you do put the top skins on. Right now, you will just have the uh, E904 and the front spar and the E913 on the top side. Those will be the only three. So as long as you get those sandwiched there together, once you put the top skin on, it's, it's just, it's ready to go. The only other thing with the top skin there in step seven where you're attaching it is to make sure how it says in the directions, um, the order that the the tabs are supposed to go in. So the, the closeout tab on the top goes between the shear clip and the tab on the bottom skin. In the next step, step eight, where you're trimming down the trailing edge wedge for both sides, the only thing I would point out is that they've given you exactly the right amount of material for the two trailing edge wedges. Uh, I mean, like down to the exact number of rivet holes. You can see here, like this is the only bit of excess. <laughs> they did it perfectly. I just cut it down the middle there with the snips to split it in half, and then I ran both pieces through the bandsaw just to get a nice clean edge. All right, so on to 9-7, uh, match drilled the holes in the closeout tabs. Uh, I had to just push it down with my finger so it would sit flush while drilling. And then we used the 12 inch uh, number 30 drill bit for the holes because that forwardmost one I think was a little hard to get with the drill, the Pan Am drill there if we had a regular bit on it just because it's sitting kind of close to the, the flanges there of the rear spar. We're now on to attaching the um, elevator horns to the front spars and the root ribs. And this is where it gets interesting again. If you remember, I mentioned that it said on 9-5 step one that you are specifically not supposed to enlarge the holes connecting the root ribs to the front spars. It says to leave them at 332nd inch and not to enlarge them to 1 8 inch. Uh, those holes are now about to be final drilled with the elevator horn. And the holes in the elevator horn are already big enough for a copper Clico to fit through. But obviously again, the holes in the front spar and in the root rib are all 3 32nd uh, inch holes. So first we had to attach everything with silver Clicos, but your final drilling using a number 30 drill bit. So after drilling, we'd have to put a copper Clico in there to hold them together. I don't know why it says to leave it at the 3 32nd inch holes and then we're now enlarging them in this part. If I had to make my best guess, I'm guessing it's because they want to have like 
super precise uh, alignment, I guess, with where all the holes are on the spars and the elevator horn and then the root ribs in the elevator horn. Um, it doesn't say, but so this, that step I mentioned earlier with the 9-5 step one, here's where you're now like enlarging the holes um, to be the 1 8 inch as you are final drilling them with the elevator horn. Moving on, uh, Tyler's over there marking up the WD-415 trim cable anchor brackets uh, to put the holes in them and into the um, cover plates. After that, you're getting the attachment hardware ready for the reinforcement plates, and part of that is the K1100 nut plates. It talks about there in step five about the K1100 nut plates will accommodate the dimple for the screws in the reinforcement plate, but will have to be dimpled for the nut plate attachment rivet C section 5R. If you go and look in 5R installing nut plates there, uh, it says that in order to dimple the nut plate, it is sometimes necessary to use a reduced diameter female dimple die so it will clear the threaded or countersunk portion of the nut plate. And here's what it's talking about. You can see in this picture that this is a nut plate if I'm using the regular dimple dies that we use for dimpling everything else around the plane. This female end here, you can see is butting up against that countersunk part of the nut plate. And so we obviously don't want that. That's not gonna work. It says in the instructions that you can grind away the portion of one side of the die that's in the way, but uh, we instead opted to get a small diameter dimple die that they sell. Now you're not gonna have any issues when you're trying to dimple it. It's not gonna squish anything that it's not supposed to. <laughs> so uh, these come in handy definitely in other spots throughout the build, not just with nut plates. So uh, we have the small diameter dies for both the 332nd and the 1 8 inch holes. As you can see by now, everybody's favorite part has begun, the part that's the most demoralizing and makes you feel awful because you're tearing everything apart and going back to nothing. <laughs> so everything got disassembled, and what I will say is that now's a great time before you rip everything to pieces to double check and make sure you've got everything like labeled and numbered and you know the orientation of things like the gusset, those type of things. Now's a good time to make sure it's all written down on all the parts before you rip it to shreds. I'm gonna skip past most of the deburring since you've all seen plenty of that by this point in time, but I'm gonna hit the skids again here on 9-7 step nine, where you are dimpling the holes in the E1001 A and B skins and the E19 counterbalance skin. I am gonna be jumping around between like five different steps here to try and explain what went through my head at this point. So just to make it perfectly clear here, look at this diagram. This is what I'm talking about. These two holes right here, this is what I'm referring to. There's two on the top skin and there's two on the bottom skin. So keep this in mind as we move forward now. Okay, so we're on 9-7, step nine right now, where it's saying to dimple the skins. I'm gonna look back quickly and show you where on 9-7, step three, it says to final drill all of the holes of the E1001 A and B skins and the underlying structure using a number 40 drill. Part of the underlying structure there is the tip rib assembly with the E904, E903, and E913 that we put together earlier. If you look back to 9-2 step six, when we're putting together these tip rib assemblies for the first time, it tells you to final drill the common 332nd inch holes in the rib flanges and the counterbalance skin using a number 40 drill, but it says specifically, do not drill the line of holes around the counterbalance skin, which do not match up with a rib. Those holes are what's gonna line up with the elevator tip fairing in the future. So we didn't drill them at this point, but then when you get again to that step uh, three on 9-7, those are overlapping holes where the skins and the, sub, the underlying structure, like it says, are meeting. So we did drill those. It makes no mention at that point about don't drill those holes like it did back in uh, that step on 9-2. 
And so this is where it suddenly got me. Is I was like, wait a second. So we weren't supposed to touch anything, and I'm not doing anything else with these holes on the edge of the 913, and now I'm supposed to be dimpling. I wanted to stop and look ahead and try and see, like, am I making a mistake here, knowing that this was where those elevator tip fairings were going to attach. And so if you go look ahead in the section 12 for the empennage fairings, if you look on 12-2 in steps three and four, you're, you're getting the elevator tip fairing set up and you're supposed to go in get it all aligned, and then it says to match drill number 40, uh, and then Clico, the elevator tip fairing, using the holes in the E1001A top elevator skin, E1001B bottom elevator skin, and the E913 elevator count counterbalance skin as drill guides. Then you final drill the holes to number 30. And after that, then you go and you dimple all of the elevator tip attach holes in those skins for a CS4-4 blind rivet. So based on all of this, I did not dimple those two holes. Even though it doesn't explicitly say avoid these holes, don't do these holes, and it just says to dimple everything, I opted not to. So we did not dimple those holes there specifically because I don't know what happens if I have drilled these for number 40, dimpled them for number 40, and now I'm upsizing it to number 30, and now I'm gonna try and dimple it for a CS44 blind rivet. I'm like, that just sounds like an accident waiting to happen. I don't know how bad or even, I don't know if it's good or bad. It doesn't sound like it would be a good thing to do. So because of that, it's like, you know, ah, not going to dimple these. We're going to leave these alone. So even though it doesn't specifically say anything there in step nine about remember not to do these two holes because they're going to be where the elevator tip fairing attaches, we opted not to do it for exactly what I just said. So those two holes on the top and bottom on both sides, we left alone and we did not dimple those. I really hope that makes sense because I have been struggling trying to figure out how to explain what's in my brain and visualize it for y'all. So I, I hope after the countless times of recording and re-recording this, that that makes sense what I just said. When you get to 9-8 step two, you're machine countersinking the inboard 29 holes in the top flange of the rear spars to accept the skin dimples. And you're doing this so that it's flat on the backside where the trim tab hinge is going to attach to it. I was a little concerned about having a situation with chatter with when countersinking just because of the thickness of the flange there on the rear spars. And so this might have been complete overkill, but just for some peace of mind, I decided to take a scrap piece of aluminum angle that I had. Uh, the aluminum angle wasn't long enough to cover the full 29 holes, but it covered a, a fair number of them. But I used some Clico clamps and clamped it to the backside there of the top flange and then I match drilled holes into it. I then Clicoed the aluminum angle there behind it and I went in between the Clicos and countersunk those holes uh, with that aluminum angle behind it. This way just to help again if the countersink went like ever so slightly too far through that flange, I wasn't gonna end up with a chatter situation because the hole there in the aluminum angle that I'd put behind it would continue to guide the, um, the countersink cutter. And so again, this might've been total overkill, but I just didn't wanna have a problem with the rear spar there and having a chatter situation come up. And now do I have to replace the whole rear spar? And that's super long and now having to deal with shipping. And it just was like, I'm just gonna, I would rather be extra cautious and err on the side of caution and just not have a problem here. So that's how I chose to approach it.
All right, so we are coming up on 30 minutes here, and so I am going to call that a wrap and call this Elevators Part 1 and finish up the rest later at another time. But I hope this was really helpful, and I once again want to say thank you to anybody who goes up and signs up on the Patreon account. And as a little teaser, Tyler and I have come up with a name for the plane, and it's pretty good, and there's a great little story to go with it. So I will be sharing that on the Discord server with the patrons for Plane Lady. But thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give me a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so for more videos like these and to follow along as we build our RV tech.